welcome back to our main stage sessions. Now, we've had so much talk about transformation, about not only generating visions, but we also got some tools and tool sets into our hands, how to actually get them on the ground and um, implement them in the real world. Now, maybe let's imagine we're really good at this and in the next month and years, we really get to where we want to be. Could we actually be too successful in a way that suddenly there's no need for us anymore, specifically if we are researchers or teachers. Could the acad uh, uh, academic become superfluous? Now, that's an argument that could be made, and that's one that maybe has already been heard, but our next speaker argues, yes, of course, to some extent, but no, the academic as such will still be necessary in this world, specifically in his role or her role of really exercising judgment on really difficult, complex matters, out in this world, somebody who really has a systemic view on things, probably that's nothing that AI will be able to do for us even in the next years. So I'm very happy to have him here on stage. He is best known for his foundational work in the field of social epistemology and currently working on it as Auguste Comte Professor of Social Epistemology at the University of Warwick, but somehow he also has turned his current focus on re researching specifically the future sustainability of humanity. He is very on point as a speaker, so be prepared not only for a very in-depth talk, but also a talk that will shake things up. Please welcome on stage Steve Fuller. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, the first thing to say is I am one of the endangered species. I am a professional academic. Um, I got my PhD way back in 1985, uh, and I have been a full professor for the last 30 years. So uh, I am one of the people under threat, you might say, uh, because I think as the introduction indicated very clearly, if we think about the university as basically a service provider, right? So a service provider in terms of certain knowledge that you need to have in order to get a job, certain knowledge you need to have in order to move around the world successfully, right? There are kind of even non-human ways of getting access to that knowledge that does not require going to a university. And so this is why I've, I wrote a book uh, that was published uh, last year with Springer uh, called Back to the University's Future. Because if the university has a future, it is going to have to do with recovering what it was about in the first place when the modern university got established, which was here in Berlin in 1810, and the great man behind it was Wilhelm von Humboldt. And his idea, broadly speaking, was that the kind of radical movements against tradition and against conventional ways of thinking that were, uh, that were epitomized by the 18th century movement known as the Enlightenment ought to be brought into the university. It shouldn't be existing outside the university. And I think this is a really important point for people who are not familiar with the history, that the Enlightenment movement was largely an anti-university movement because the universities at the time were just basically credentials mills. And they were credentials mills to make you a priest, to make you an administrator, right, to make you a doctor, right, we still have some of these professions today, to be a lawyer, right, that was what the universities were about, and primarily what they taught was the kind of stuff that generation after generation had been taught. So there was no clear sense that there was a kind of research frontier, right, that there might be new knowledge that in fact contradicts or undermines the knowledge on which the credential society was based, okay? Uh, and the Enlightenment was saying, we just have to junk the universities, and what we need are academies. And all kinds of academies uh, started sprouting up in Europe, and the people who we associate with the Enlightenment, like Voltaire and Rousseau, uh, you know, in the French side especially, right, were very much people about the academies. And they had patrons who were like the great kind of um, ascending leaders of the time, who in a way were challenging established authority. So people like Frederick the Great and Peter the Great. These were the kinds of people who were actually patronizing the Enlightenment. They thought we need a, a counterpoint to the tradition. Now, you know what that led to. It led to the uh, French Revolution, uh, and this caused an enormous amount of chaos. Uh, but at the same time, it led people who were especially following Immanuel Kant, who, whose 300th birthday is this year. Okay, Immanuel Kant, 
the person who is normally regarded as the greatest of the modern philosophers, certainly you might say the founding figure of modern philosophy, he is the person who inspired Humboldt, okay? Um, and, and that's because uh, Kant thought about the Enlightenment not just as a way for certain kinds of ambitious kings to be able to gain advantage over the church or other traditional types of authority, but rather it was a way for everyone to realize that the knowledge business isn't done. It isn't just about getting credentials about the things that have already been known. Rather, there's an open frontier. There is a kind of real space where we can overturn established authorities in a kind of disciplined, methodical, and rational way. And that is what you would be taught in a university. So the key thing that Humboldt introduced, that is kind of the hallmark of the modern university, is the idea that the same people would be teaching and doing research. That is the key point. So it's something about who the academic personality is. And, and if you've seen the, the kind of title of the talk, right, homo academicus, who is that person? What does that person exemplify? It's not just a smart person. It's not just a person who can teach you stuff that you need to do to pass exams or get a job or something like that, right? But it's a, it's a certain kind of person who, when, when he or she is not in the classroom, is actually trying to push the frontiers of knowledge. So in other words, this person is actually in the business, when they're not in the classroom, of trying to undermine the authority on which the classroom knowledge is based. So they have this kind of somewhat schizoid role. And that is what the teaching and research synthesis is about, right? Where in a sense, you're teaching students what we know now, but you have to do it in a way that conveys to students the fact that this knowledge, yes, it's been around for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, whatever, but it's not necessarily going to be around forever. And I'm one of the people who's actually trying to undermine it. I'm not maybe doing it in a very radical revolutionary way on the streets, but nevertheless, in the kinds of things I think about, right, in the kinds of seminars, let's say I have with my graduate students and so forth, I am actually trying to overturn the system because I realize even though we need a system at the moment, right, the system doesn't have to last forever. And this is what Humboldt he brought this very radical vision of the Enlightenment, which Kant, in a way, very much generalized. But of course, at the political level, it led in the short term to the French Revolution, which was an incredibly bloody kind of uh, event. And actually, uh, until the Russian Revolution of 1917 was largely seen throughout Europe as a failure and why revolution shouldn't happen, right? Until about, until Lenin, and then it changed. And then we have now this kind of more mixed picture and, and usually people are quite positive about the French Revolution. But this took a long time, actually, to establish because it was seen as such a, a bloody act that was based on what seemed to be Enlightenment principles. Okay, so what, what Humboldt did was, in a certain way, if you want to be a bit cynical about it, was to domesticate the Enlightenment, right? Made the Enlightenment institutional, okay? And why did he do that? Well, because... Humboldt, of course, was the Minister of Education here, right? Prussia, which, you know, if you look at the late 18th and early 19th century, it's an aspirational country. It is not a country of the first rank, right? That only comes at the end of the 19th century with Bismarck. But Prussia is basically an aspirational country. It's a country that's starting in, in lots of different ways from a somewhat different position uh, from where France and England, which are the leading countries at the time, right? Uh, and so the issue is going to be, how is Prussia going to maneuver in this space that in a way has already been created, right? In the case of England, we're talking about liberalism and capitalism and what became the Industrial Revolution. And of course, in France, we're talking about the Enlightenment and the general kind of uh, situation of the French language being sort of the lingua franca right, by which all intellectual communication was taking place, right? So, so this is kind of the obstacles, you might say, uh, that people in this part of the world had to deal with. And so they had to, and so Humboldt is thinking in this very strategic way about this. And so his idea was that you would reinvent the university. And this is what he basically did here in Berlin in 1810. He reinvented the university. He got rid of, first of all, its association with churches, because, of course, most of the universities, the 
probably all of the universities prior to that point were affiliated with either the Catholic Church or one of the Protestant churches, okay? Um, and, and theology played a very important role, and it played a very important role in a way that enabled the, the, the universities to be very um, tight with the, uh, with the state. And Humboldt really changed that picture uh, because he clearly made the university a kind of secular institution. This was a very hard fought battle, I would say, and it wasn't completely won even within Germany. Um, but nevertheless, this was kind of the issue uh, because he thought that it was very important that the academic as a person and the people who the academic was talking to was a person who was allowed to be free in their speech, free in their expression. Okay, um, and Humboldt was very important in this regard in terms of talking about the complementarity of freedom. So in other words, it's not just a matter of the teacher speaking freely and saying what they think about various things, right? But it is also, as the teacher is doing that, they have to do it in a way that enables the student to speak freely, right? So this is a very tricky kind of freedom. It's a freedom that is of the student and to the teacher simultaneously. So you just can't say anything you want and tell students to shut up. That's not allowed, right? But the point is you can still speak freely, but then allow them to speak freely back. Again, not an easy thing to do in practice, but nevertheless, that was always part of what academic freedom was, right? It was a complementarity between the freedom of the teacher to speak in the classroom and the freedom of the student. And then protocols need to be established for the teacher to allow the space for the students to speak. And what that meant in practice in the 19th century and the 20th century as well, and especially as this Humboldtian model spread across the world, was that there were a lot of student groups, student reading groups, that were reading books and things that perhaps were not being taught in the classroom, but nevertheless the university would allow the space for these people, these self-organizing groups of people to operate. And in fact, what became a lot of the, what we call the revolutionary cells, right, of people uh, in the third world who studied at Western universities, right, very often they, they sort of began in that kind of fashion, okay? And that is part of the notion of academic freedom too. And so it's a very difficult, you know, if you, if you look at it from the standpoint of performance, it's actually a very difficult thing to pull off successfully. But nevertheless, it is this personality that was very much at the core of what the Humboldtian admission of the university is. And of course, we are in the process of losing that. Um, and the other thing, and, and this is sort of implied in some of my earlier remarks, is that we're also losing a really key component that was very much central to Kant's thinking. If you think about Immanuel Kant, if you know anything about him, um, one of the way I kind of read Kant's three critiques is that it was all leading up to the critique of judgment, the final critique, okay? And judgment is the key issue here. And that what that means is what you want to see in the teacher is an ability uh, not just to state their own point of view in a very eloquent, you know, oratorical manner. I mean, we have public speakers and public intellectuals who do that all the time. What you want is someone who is able to actually articulate the different points of view that are on the table, right, in an equally persuasive manner, you might say, and then give reasons why they stand on one position for one position rather than another, right? So in other words, they give reasons why after you have all of these possibilities arrayed before you, right, why should you think that this is better than that? And it's that moment right, where this comparison is being made, where you're critical of the alternatives, right, that judgment is being exercised. And that, you might say, is the, cog is the cardinal cognitive faculty of the academic person, right? It is someone who publicly can exercise judgment and say, after I've looked at all these alternatives, and I have weighed them, and I've studied them, I stand here. I may be wrong, I may change my mind, but this is where I stand. And why do you want students to be exposed to that? It's not because uh, you want students to agree with you. It's because you want students to see what it's like to do that. What it's like to exercise judgment. See, the performance is, you know, what you're supposed to, in a sense, if you have to imitate anything about a teacher, 
right? It's not what they, you know, it's not just to repeat what they say, but it is to study the way they say it. What are they thinking? How are they thinking about this? How are they presenting this thought in practice? That is what you want to take away from a university education. You want to learn how to think in public. And that is the thing I think of most of all that we are in threat of losing. Okay? Because as we think about education, as more and more about content delivery, right? Content delivery, being able to pass exams, being able to get credentials, right? The more we focus on that, the more that, in fact, we disappear the academic personality. Because the academic personality has always been about being a certain kind of person in the world. It's a certain kind of role you play. And that was the genius of Humboldt, okay? And so this is a, this is a very tricky kind of issue. So what we do, what, you know, if you, if you want to look at the, 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 the long history of this, uh, because I would say for about the first hundred years after Humboldt, because the Humboldtian image of the university was incredibly successful, uh, and, uh, and it was especially successful because, in a way, uh, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't prejudiced in, in traditional sorts of ways in terms of religion and class and so forth. It really brought in a wider range of people into the, you know, the, the university sector than ever before. So it, it really functioned kind of in the way that Humboldt wanted, which was to be a kind of dynamo for state expansion. Right, so people from all walks of life would be able to go to a university if they, if they passed exams and, 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 and then were able to succeed in the kind of regime that was promoted in the classroom. Um, now, this worked for about 100 years, and many countries around the world copied it, including the United States, of course. The United States is, you might say, the greatest beneficiary of the Humboldtian model of the university. Uh, but you also see it across other, other countries as well. And it was really important as a nation-building exercise. So, you know, all this stuff that, that I've been talking about, about the academic personality and how they should behave and how they should appear and so forth, it's not simply a kind of idealistic vision, right, of, of the person of learning, but rather it's something that actually had very sorts of concrete practical impact because it led a lot of politicians, especially, who were exposed to this kind of system, to think much more creatively. Some people might say too creatively, but much more creatively about the possibilities that are available for changing the world. Okay, the Humboldtian University really opened that horizon tremendously. Okay, and it affected not only the scientists who went through it, but also the politicians as well. And as a result, we have this much more expansively oriented world and thinking about the world, as well as one that is much more risky, there's no doubt about it, right? Where people maybe are a little too quick to overturn established authority and so forth. But nevertheless, that I would say is the downstream effect of the Humboldtian University. And exhibit A is Karl Marx. Right, Karl Marx is one of the relatively early beneficiaries of this kind of education, and you see what he became and so forth, right? And in a sense, he, this set a certain kind of precedent. So there is no doubt that in terms of the impact that the Humboldtian model of the university has had with regard to the academic personality and the impact that has on students, there's no, you know, so when if you know anything about Karl Marx, right, a lot of his early writings are basically saying Hegel doesn't go far enough, right? Hegel being the great philosophy lecturer, right, in Berlin, right, uh, in the period just before Karl Marx, right, he, you know, Marx is basically spending his time thinking about what Hegel's up to, right? Because in some sense, Hegel is providing some kind of vanguard vision because he is talking about what the open horizons are. And that is, in fact, what the academic ought to be doing. That is the exercise of judgment. And you can agree or disagree. And, of course, if you present this in a very compelling way, right, then people, a lot of people will disagree, but it'll get them active. It'll get them motivated, right? It, and, and that will then fuel the way they think about the rest of their lives. 
So again, all of this stuff could disappear tomorrow if people are very obsessed with the idea of the university as a content delivery service, where there's just certain stuff you need to know, pass the exams, how do I find out? I can go on YouTube and have a short course and I can avoid all the lectures. And of course, the lecturers know this as well. And so, in fact, the performance standards of academics have dropped tremendously. And of course, there's all this uh, ritualized dumbing down that academics do. For example, PowerPoint. PowerPoint is a great way to become stupid, right? Because you basically become this kind of lip syncing monkey right you know so if you if you if you see somebody with an enormously compelling set of powerpoints while they're speaking you say well i want the powerpoints but fire the guy talking and this is one of the reasons by the way why universities across the world right want to create intellectual property for teaching materials right because that then says we're not going to lose that much if we fire this guy, because we've already got the stuff he's done for the course, and that's really where the action is, right? So you're bullet pointing yourselves to death if you uh, use PowerPoint. And so there is, so and, and, and the thing is, of course, the academics who do this think it's making their lives easier. And then you wonder, well, why are you an academic in the first place? I mean, wh wh what, in what sense is this easier? What are you doing otherwise? Right? Uh, and, and say, well, I need to write these research articles. But these research articles aren't pushing the frontiers of knowledge very much. They're just also ways of keeping your job. Right? And it becomes important that they get cited a lot by other people. And are they important? Doesn't really matter whether they're important. The citations are really what count. So again, even when you're a professional academic, in a sense, you're, you're, you're treating your own research activity as a glorified credentials exercise, right? It's a way of keeping myself up to date so I can stay employed and run with the big dogs, right, in academia. There's, there's no, no substance, there's, there's no thinking going on here. And so you can have people do that, but they don't need to be academics. So you can have institutes that just spend all their time doing research and churning out stuff and they can churn out stuff for other scientists or they can churn out stuff for the government or whoever the client happens to be they can just churn that stuff out and then you can have teaching mills right and, and most of them don't even have to involve people whereby you guarantee that if you come to this place it's online you don't have to leave your house right we have a 70 80 percent chance that if you pass this you will get a job that will have a in starting income of this level right we can have a world like that in fact we're moving toward a world like that we're even moving toward a world like that within the university sector where the research side and the teaching side are increasingly segregated right different people are being hired to do different things and all of them are are, are treated as if they're going to disappear at some point so you imagine then, where is the university? Where, where is the institution of the university in all this? Because look, even in my university, which is a relatively prestigious university, and this is common across even the top tier universities in the United Kingdom, we have 70% of our staff on short-term contracts, 70. How can you sustain a university as a concept like that, where everybody is just trying to meet performance standards and look for the next job, right? And so the idea of the university as a place where a certain kind of mentality is cultivated and developed is disappearing in our midst. And those of us who are academics are largely complicit with it. Of course, you can blame capitalism. Of course, you can blame the state. You can blame, you can blame all these larger entities. But at the end of the day, the academics themselves are very complicit in this, and not least the academic administrators who run universities. They are hollowing out the Humboldtian mission of the university. And what I'm trying to do, uh, so in this book I've written and a lot of stuff I've written over the last uh, several years, is in some sense to remind people what is the spirit of the university, the Humboldtian spirit. And it is basically one where you develop a kind of critical judgment because when you're teaching students, you are also someone who is doing cutting edge research and you're bringing that to the classroom and you're reassuring students that no matter what I think as an authority, it might well be wrong and I invite you to participate in this process. And I will stop here. Thank you.
a lot. Thanks a lot. Oh, oh, that is my mistake. Ah. Okay, now I switched off the microphone. That was my mistake. Um, thanks a lot, Steve, um, for your wonderful presentation. We have some thoughts in the comments. Let me just give you an insight here. Um, Antonia Wunderlich agreed, sort of, I think. She wrote, we are the ones who must never stop truly thinking, critically and inquisitively, even when it hurts our pragmatism, uh, pragmatism or when people find it inconvenient or complicated. Now, let's see, there's a comment by Anne Koppenburger. She writes, okay, love this expression. The future academics hopefully won't think of themselves as who, we who think truly. The future academic needs to be capable of judging according to open standards. The future academic will have to stop being social chauvinistic in order to survive, but rather appealing to the people to think for themselves. I think that was more like a discussion in there just to give you an insight. Um, now, how do you bring this into, how do you implement this? Do you see some institutions out there who actually are really good in enforcing your thought or freeing also teachers or academics of the obligations of, you know, no. um, writing the next research? No, no, I, I, to be honest with you, um, one of the reasons why I'm saying this is because Someone like myself, who's in a senior, you know, relatively senior position, I've been around for a long time, um, I actually have the freedom to talk this way, right? Uh, because it's pretty unlikely I'll be fired for doing it, and it's pretty unlikely that it will impede my, my job possibilities in the future because I've written so many books and done so many things that I'm pretty known quantity. People either love me or hate me, right? So, so I don't have to worry about, oh, people might get the wrong impression about me. They probably already have an impression about me. And I think, and there are a lot of academics in senior positions who've in a sense established themselves in certain ways. And I would say those people actually have the obligation and, and, and the obligation in terms of their practice, how they, you know, how they lecture in classrooms, Right, the kinds of stuff they write about, the way they intervene in things. So, so I think it's 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 very. Un, I, I hate to be, you know, to 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 uh, to say this, but I think having seen all these younger academics who we have, right, in my department as well, uh, they're really struggling. They're 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 all these things that they're being asked to do and so forth, and they just don't have time to think about this kind of more expansive, big vision kind of stuff. And I don't blame them. Right? The point is, I don't blame them. But I do think the people like myself, right, uh, have an obligation uh, to be open, you know, and, and, and about that, all right? Uh, and, and, you know, to, in many ways to be, you know, counter to what university administration has to say, because if you look within the university structure, if anyone can counter what university administrators do, it's the senior professors, right? So, but I guess then after all those years, first focusing on the one part, you need to rediscover the skill of really exposing yourself again. Yeah. Now, quick questions, quick answers. Sure, sir. Um, what do you think about self-paced online courses? I mean, a lot depends on what you want, okay? Mm -hmm. And if, you know, so for example, um, you know, if you want to learn a certain kind of content area, like let's say if I wanted to learn German, that might be a good idea, okay, in some sense. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's particularly good from the standpoint of what I was promoting mm. as being uh, the, the essential feature of the academic personality. Because see, this is part of what's going on here, right? It's, it's about why do we need academics? It's not about what's useful for people to learn stuff. I mean, I'm all for people having the easiest way possible to find out things if that's what they're doing. But that's not the only thing in the world. There is also a certain kind of skill, a certain kind of person that the academic is that is endangered. And that is what I'm promoting here. Now, we have a quick changeover to the next keynote. Question. So unfortunately, we have to tie up the questions here. here. But um, on the one hand, you can use my laptop to see what's been going on in the chat. And I'm sure you're around for a couple of minutes to talk to sure. all the people who are in the room. So let's use the opportunity to physically connect you here. Um, having said that, thanks a lot, Steve, for joining us today. Okay, okay thank you.